Pastor the Radford Worship Center. If you're viewing online, uh, we want to welcome you uh, today with us. We want to welcome all of our guests. And if you're watching online and you have a prayer request, go ahead to the comment section and just write special request, or you can write out your request, and I will collect those this afternoon. And as well, we'd like you to share and like today's message. Now, this morning we're bringing to a conclusion the series Standing Strong in a Culture of Shifting Sand. I've said this each week, and if you are uh, a guest with us today, uh, this series came from a survey last July. We call it You Asked For It. The survey will be put in a folder again beginning in July. And, uh, you know, uh, all we're asking for is some suggestions of some, of some things that you might want to hear. We want to be prayerful about it. And, uh, and if I did not get to yours this past year, uh, go ahead and resubmit it. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to, my best to get to it uh, this, this coming year. Uh, but the question was asked was this, how do we live as Christians in a world or a culture uh, that we're presently living in? Uh, because we all know times are dire. We know the culture's changed and is diametrically opposed to the Christian faith. We see that uh, every day. So how do we respond? What do we do as believers living in an ungodly culture? And we get some insight in the book of Daniel. And I said at the very beginning that Daniel is both a prophetic book, it's one of the major prophets, but it's also a historical book. There are six chapters in Daniel that are historical events. Those things actually occurred. They are not metaphors being spoken, okay? It is actual history. Uh, but yet, in that history, we see prophecy speaking to us today, okay? Now, uh, Daniel gives us a clear picture of what culture attempts to do to indoctrinate us and to assimilate us as God's people. Now, in week one, we saw this. Uh, we saw that culture's greatest goal, culture's greatest goal is to change your identity. Culture wants your identity changed so you will not fulfill your destiny in order that you'll lose your influence. Our life is about influence, okay? And if we're not different, church, uh, we can't make a difference. That's just the facts. So, so therefore, culture wants to change our identity. Second, culture's greatest test, we said, is to steal your worship. There are new gods every day that we can worship, aren't they? This world offers more gods for us to bow down to uh, every day. So therefore, uh, week two, that's what culture wants to do, steal your worship of God. Week three, we saw culture's, culture's uh, greatest sin. The culture's greatest sin is pride. It was pride that led to Nebuchadnezzar's insanity. Okay, and until Nebuchadnezzar, uh, after seven years of, of being reduced to living like an animal and acting like an animal, he finally looks to the heavens and he, and he acknowledges that God rules, heaven rules, and he began to glorify the Most High. When he did that, God changed him in a moment. His sanity returned and his kingdom was restored. Stored. And, and then in weeks four, five, and six, we saw culture's greatest illusions. There were two, deception and distraction. Okay, we looked at King Belshazzar, and we saw that he was deceived. He was young. He thought he could rule for a long time. He'd only been into his rule for two years. He was in his 40s. He thought he had plenty of time to live. He had no regard for God. He was defiling what was holy. He was only concerned or, or about his own self-interest. That was the distractions in his life. It was about him. It was about self. It was about his joy. So, so therefore, he, he totally ignored the gift and the calling that God had on his life. He totally ignored his responsibility to rule. And, and because of that, he, he was unaware that night that the, that the Medes and the Persians were sitting right outside the door getting ready to invade Babylon, and his life would be required that night. And a prophetic warning was given to, to Belshazzar that night that his days were numbered. Our days are numbered. We, we glean from that, that we're responsible how we live those days. Our lives are being weighed in the balance. His life was being weighed in the balance. And that night, uh, God spoke to Belshazzar, and he said, your kingdom is going to be divided tonight. And we looked at it from the perspective, if culture can divide our hearts, it's going to divide our allegiance to the kingdom of God, will it not? If we have a fractured heart, we can't give him our whole heart. So, so today we are on the fifth and final 
uh, uh, message, and today we're calling it Culture's Greatest Need. Okay, number five, culture's greatest need is grace and it's truth. That's what our culture needs, church. This culture that we live in, they need the grace of God and they need truth. Now, you know, this, this is the warning. We, just like our lives are being weighed in the balance, grace and truth must be in perfect balance with one another. If we just err like some people on the side of truth, we're hammering truth, we're hammering truth, we're hammering truth, the next thing you know, you become hardened and legalistic. You don't give people the grace that they need. Don't forget Jesus came in grace and He came in truth. John said that. He came with the balancing act. He spoke the truth, but He was always offering grace. To that woman who was thrown at his feet, who was a prostitute, caught in the act, he gave her grace. He said, neither do I condemn you. That's grace. But then he gave her truth. He said, go and sin no more. Okay? He, he, did, he did not try to cover up her actions. He called it what it was. It was sin. And he said, stop sinning. Okay? All right? And he gave her grace. I'm not going to condemn you, but you've got to stop sinning. So therefore, we have to be a people who offer grace and truth. John Knox said this, You cannot antagonize and influence at the same time. You cannot antagonize people and influence them at the same time. We have to remember that because we're living in a time of harvest. Too many people believe and they say, well, at the end days, you know, there's going to be a great harvest. There's going to be a great revival. Let me just share this with you. Jesus said this in Luke chapter 10 and verse 2. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great and the workers are few. When Jesus declared that truth that day, over 2,000 years ago to his disciples, he was saying that the time of harvest is now. He's saying, open your eyes, disciples. He said, look at the harvest. Look at the lost people who are out there. He said, now is the time of harvest. But we've got to pray for laborers that people are, are going to help us in this harvest. And that's got to be the prayer of the church. Harvest time, church, is now. And the workers are even fewer today in this culture. We have that responsibility that God has given us. See, we're living in a culture that's searching. That's why the harvest is ripe. Understand, this world is searching. How do I know? Because people are trying to fill a void in their life through their addictions, through their relationships. Some people have children. Some couples have children thinking it's going to make things better. It's going to fill a void. No, it will not. Finances will not fill the void of your life. People, they're constantly entertaining themselves, constantly doing things, trying to fulfill a void. They're, they're trying to fill that hole in their life that only Jesus can fill. God has put eternity in our heart. That's the void. And, he, and Jesus is the only way to fill that void. That's why the harvest is right. People are searching. They may not be searching for God, but they are searching for something, and we know that someone who can fill it. <coughs> so the harvest is now. Daniel, think about it. Here, here Daniel was thrown in to this Babylonian culture. And that man, because of his influence, touched four kings' lives. Now, how did he do this? How could he live in such an ungodly culture and influence it? See, that's the purpose of this series. Today, it comes to a culmination. And I'm going to share with you how we can influence the culture. I don't care how wicked it is, how dark it is, you and I, have been given the power to influence. And we're going to take a look at how Daniel did this, and we're going to apply it to us. Number one is this. Daniel was a man of exceptional qualities, exceptional qualities. In Daniel 6 and 3, the Scripture says this. This man, Daniel, distinguished himself among the other officials and the satraps. You know, I, I love that scripture right there because here you had a slave in a foreign culture who distinguished himself above every wise man, every soothsayer, every politician in Babylon. Let me just say this this morning. Daniel drove the political beltway crazy in Babylon. Those men hated him. They hated his guts. 
Why? Because he distinguished himself. The kings recognized this. Think about it. Here Daniel was the anti-Babylonian spirit. He was the anti-culture. And kings respected him. And kings gave him favor. And kings noticed him. And kings put him in charge. Just think about this a moment. When King Darius, which we'll get to in, 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 in a moment, it's King Darius here in chapter 6 that is thinking about putting this man in charge of everything. Here you go. A Jew in charge of an Iranian government. Isn't that an irony? Because that's exactly who the Persians were. They were Iranians. And this man was so distinguished in his life that he was throwing all that aside. All the culture, all the racism, everything aside. He looked at this man's life and said, I need this man in my, in my kingdom. I don't know what Daniel said to King Darius or King Nebuchadnezzar when he went behind closed doors, but I, I guarantee you with this, he spoke with respect, he spoke in humility, he spoke in wisdom, okay? Whatever he said was, had such an air about it that these kings would listen to him. He didn't get militant, he didn't scream and shout, he didn't raise his voice above the voices of others trying to prove his point right. Daniel operated in grace and in truth. And that is what distinguishes us. I believe that God has gifted certain people in apologetics, Ravi Zacharias being probably the greatest. But you know what? If you've ever watched him, I watch his YouTube videos. The guy fascinates me. This is, the, I mean, the guy's anointed. He's smart. I don't care if he's, if he is, you know, being debated by uh, an Islamic cleric or he's being confronted by an atheist. The man always operates in grace, number one, and truth, second. That's why that atheist who says there is no God will stand there and listen to what he has to say. Number two, Daniel was a man with an extraordinary spirit. In, in verse 6, 3, it says, Because there was an extraordinary spirit in him, the king thought about putting him in charge of this whole kingdom. See, see, the king recognized something else in Daniel. Not only had he distinguished himself as a man, but he, he saw the reason that he distinguished himself because he had an extraordinary spirit. Darius could see that this man's heart was different from the hearts of the other people that surrounded him. His character was impeccable. Daniel's character was impeccable. Impeccable to the point that his political opponents were plotting his death and they could not find any guilt. Think about that. Anytime there's an election in the United States on any level, as soon as somebody tries to uncover dirt, guess what they find? The mother load. They find dirt. But with Daniel, it was different. I love the scripture, verse 4. It said, the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs. They said, let's go through his records. Let's go through his files. Okay, let's get the people that are working with him. Let's see if we can find something that he's doing illegally. Let, let's catch him. Let's trap him. Let's embarrass him publicly and before the king. But they couldn't find anything, what? To criticize? Goodness gracious, that's clean. I guarantee you if we're looking for something, we can find something to criticize, right? They couldn't even criticize this guy. He was so clean. They were looking for something to condemn him, and they could not find it. This is what they discovered. He was faithful. People who distinguish themselves and have an extraordinary spirit are faithful. They're faithful. They're responsible. When you give them a task, 
His task was, was, had a government role. He did it unto his God first. That's what responsible people do. Whatever we do in word or in deed, we are to do it unto who? Unto the Lord, right? Is that not what the Scripture says? We're to do it unto the Lord. That's what responsible people do. I'm not doing this job necessarily for my employer. I'm doing it first for God because I'm doing it first for God. Now I'll do it for my employer in excellence, right? That's, that's what responsible people do. And notice the third thing. They found he was completely trustworthy, completely trustworthy. He distinguished himself. Wouldn't it be great to have a bunch of politicians in Washington with that kind of character? That the next time you hear, well, we're going to dig up dirt on them. Oh, go ahead. Dig as deep as you want. You're not going to find a thing because I'm clean. Number three, Daniel allowed God to transform him. That, this is so important. He allowed God to mold him into the man that he became. If we go all the way back to Daniel chapter 1 uh, in verse 17, you know, when he took his stand, he had this resolve. God blessed him. And notice what 17, I'm going to refer to it. God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings and visions of visions and dreams. Now, why is this important? How does that change us? See, God gifted him and gave him a purpose. He received those gifts and he used those gifts responsibly. He could be trusted with those gifts. He walked out those gifts. Just like God has given every person in this room gifts and abilities and a purpose, he has entrusted you with a gift. When Jesus ascended, he gave gifts, the Bible said, to men. They are resident in you. And when we step out in those gifts, you know what happens to us? We begin to change. We begin to fulfill the purpose of God. And that's the reason that God gives us the gifts. You know, Paul said this, that, that God beforehand, before we were ever created, had, had works ahead of us that He had given for us to do. The thing I love about that Scripture is simply this, is when He created me, He didn't look at me and say, now what am I going to do with this guy? He had a work. He had a destiny. Then He created me specifically for that work and that destiny. And I'm the only one that can fulfill it. And you're the only one that can fulfill yours. You're the only one. See, Daniel had a destiny. God was going to use him politically. God was going to use him spiritually. God was going to use him to influence a culture. He received those gifts in Daniel chapter 1. He began to walk in those gifts, and his life began to change, and he began to change others and influence others. That's what we do when we surrender. Paul said it this way in, in 2 Corinthians. He said, for the Lord is the Spirit. I'm going to define the word Spirit, then I'm going to define the word glory. Uh, the word Spirit in, in the Greek New Testament is pneuma. Okay, that word pneuma basically means a blast of wind. It means a breath of life. Okay, it means air. For the Lord is the breath of life. He's the blast of wind. And wherever the breath of life is, there's freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed, this is the believer, can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. The word glory means full weight. So what is Paul saying? He's saying when God breathes life into you, new birth into you, new life into you, he said this, 
He said, we will reflect the full weight of God's presence. That is the distinguishing spirit, the extraordinary spirit in you if you're a believer. The people can see the full weight of God's spirit, his presence in you. And the Lord, who is spirit, who is that breath of life, who is that wind, makes us more and more like him as we are changed into his glorious image. As we are changed into the full weight of God's presence. Now, what does that look like to you and I? We're going we're to break it down even further because this is so important. That's what happened in Daniel's life. Daniel was so in love with God that God, when God gifted him, God's presence was all over him. And it changed him. And people could see it. They didn't agree with Daniel politically. Those kings didn't. They didn't even agree initially with the God that he served. But they saw the full weight of God's presence on his life, and, and they took notice. And it ended up changing them, influencing them. Understand, back in the Old Testament, God's presence would come on someone. In the New Testament, when I got born again, God's presence came to reside inside of me, to change me, that he could be seen outwardly in my life. God, that's what Jesus said. You're the light of the world. You're, you're, you, you have the weight of God's presence in you to be seen by men. That's what changes culture. That's what changes the environment around you when they see God in you. They may not like you. They may not like what you believe. I don't have to agree with somebody politically. Okay? It has nothing to do with it. It has to do with God being seen in us. So what does this look like? What does this full weight of God's presence look like? Ezekiel was shown a vision many years before this. It's the same thing that John saw in Revelation chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 4, John gets a glimpse of, of the throne room of God. He gets a glimpse of the glory of God. God gave the same glimpse to this prophet Ezekiel. He had this vision. The heavens opened up. Matter of fact, this is what he said. I just put it, this, was, this is at the end, but I'm going to start with it. After he saw this vision, he said, Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of God. He said, What I just saw was God's glory. And he said, when I saw it, I fell on my face. And I heard a voice begin to speak. What did Ezekiel see? I'm not going through the whole vision, but I want us to see the four faces that he saw on these four living creatures. So let's go to Ezekiel 1, verses 4 through 6. He said, as I looked, behold, a stormy wind came out of the north and a great cloud with brightness around it. And fire flashing forth continually. He's now seen the, the very throne room of God, what's occurring. And in the midst of the fire, as it were gleaming metal, and from the midst of it came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had human likeness, but each had four faces, and each of them had four wings. Let's jump down to verse 10 and 11. As the likeness of their faces, each had a human face, the four had the face of a lion on the right side. The four had the face of an ox on the left side. And the four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. So we see four faces reflecting the glory of God. So what do they mean to us? What do they mean to Daniel? First of all, this, the human face represents relationship. 
Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man, through the incarnation, the virgin birth, He became flesh and He dwelled among us. Jesus identified with the human condition that we could identify with Him in His death, His burial, and His resurrection. He came to restore the broken relationship between God and man. His focus on earth, church, is people. And in order to minister to people, we must have relationship with people, not just with the brethren, not with those that's in our C group, not just those in the group. We are to have relationship with people outside the door. How can we influence them if we're not with them? See, Daniel didn't pull out of the culture. He stayed in the culture and built relationships with these kings. See, he had the face of the human, which represents relationship. That's what Jesus did. Jesus came for people. Jesus would look through all the junk to find the very physical and spiritual need that a person was struggling with to meet that need. See, to stand in this culture, we have to have relationships. To influence this culture, we must have relationships. And when we build them, when we build trust, with others. See, that's when God gives us the door to administer truth and grace side by side. But it takes trust, it takes respect, and it takes honor. Second, the second face that we see is the lion. The face of the lion, it represents boldness. The lion also symbolizes power and authority. You know, we, we see lions on a coat of arms. We see them on crests. We see them on, on medals. Jesus, we must not forget, when he returns, he's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He holds all authority and he holds all power. He is our king. He is our sovereign. And his followers, our power does not come from title or position. Our power comes from the Holy Spirit, the Word of God in prayer. They are the key components to to being emboldened with God's power and, and being emboldened to influence others. L let me tell you what, we can't change the world silent. Sometimes we have to speak. Sometimes we have to speak. Matter of fact, Proverbs 28 1 says this, but the godly are as bold as lions. On the, on the day of Pentecost, what happened? When, Jesus, when, when Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit, he came out of that upper room. He began to declare the Word of God boldly. I mean, he was in the face of opposition, people that, that wanted to kill him eventually. But he continued in boldness, sharing the Word of God, ministering the good news of truth and of grace. In Acts 4 and 13, notice what the Scripture says. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were uneducated. But let me tell you what, as Paul said, we don't come with enticing words. We come with the demonstration of the power of God. People were astonished. At these men, and they recognize they had been with Jesus. See, everything flows through our relationship with Him, through times of prayer and fasting, times of, of being in God's Word, times of being a part of worship. Our character, is, our character is developed, and the Spirit of God begins to move in our lives and embolden us to share. See, if you want to walk in authority and power and boldness, you've got to spend time with Jesus. But the third face is the face of steadfastness. I like this one. Okay, the ox represents steadfastness. I like that word. It's just steady. We need to be steady. That goes back to that word faithful. We have to be reliable. That's what an ox was. He was a steady, reliable beast. He was a servant animal. He would carry the yoke uh, for the master. And once again, we see sort of another face of Jesus. When Jesus came to earth, he, he fully was committed to the will and the plan of his father. He only spoke what his father told him to say. He only did what he saw his father doing in heaven. He was faithful to the mission 
of the Father. He was steadfast. He was diligent. He was never shaken. When he was on this earth, he spoke this to people. He said, hey, you have a burden? Put your burden on me. My yoke is easy. My burdens are light. I came to carry those burdens for you. See, Jesus had that face of steadfastness, which is a face of God. It's a face of His glory. It's a face that, we, that Daniel had. It's a face that you and I must have in the culture that we're living in. We have to be faithful and steadfast and be servant-hearted. Look, let me just say this. People really aren't going to care what you have to say, not unless they see that you really care by your actions. See, it's easy to say you're a servant, but we've got to serve outside these doors. We have to serve those that we need to be influenced. They have to see us as servants. You know, Jesus, you know, that his entire ministry was servant. He was a chief servant while he was here on earth. He demonstrated that at Passover. But he was also a suffering servant on the cross. And today he's in heaven as our intercessor and our advocate serving the, the church and the body today. Jesus has never quit serving because that's what he is. That's what we are. See, the secret to influence is not what we say, but it's how we live, church. And last but not least, the eagle represents excellence, respect and excellence. See, the Son of Man honored his Father first and foremost. Daniel honored God above his life. See, what we honor, we respect. What we honor, we respect. Why do I honor my dad, my earthly dad? Because I respect him. You can't separate the two. Well, who we honor, we respect. Daniel honored God. He had a holy respect or reverence for God. That's called the fear of the Lord. Daniel had that fear. But yet the eagle also represents excellence. Jesus' entire ministry, everything he did in ministry, he did in excellence. Let's go to the scripture there. This is what was said of Jesus in Mark 7 and 37. That the people were completely amazed and said again and again, everything he does is wonderful. Everything we do, we have to do in excellence. See, Daniel served the kings in excellence. He had the face of an eagle. And that's why he distinguished himself. That's why they saw that this man's heart was different. He had an extraordinary spirit in him. So let's bring this now to a close. You come to the music, if you would, please. How do we influence culture? These are not up there, but this is how we influence culture. This answers the question. Number one, we must have exceptional qualities. We must have exceptional qualities. The world ought to see something different about our character and about our lives. Second, we must allow the extraordinary spirit in us to be seen. How does that occur? We allow him to change us from glory to glory. That's, that's what we do. How does that occur? through our time that we spend with Him, through prayer, through, through knowing Him in His Word, discovering who He is. So we don't read the Bible to, as an exercise. We read the Bible so we can know the one we serve. We can know Him. It's the only way you're going to discover who you're in relationship with. It's going to be through the Word. He's going to grow us as we worship. See, you have an extraordinary spirit waiting to be seen. And I promise you this, it'll touch lives. Third, we have to be willing to be changed and transformed into His image. Now, when this happens in our life, we're going to build relationships. We can speak boldly the truth in love. We need to be steady in our service to God. This isn't the time to take the hand off the plow. This is the time that we hold on to the plow and dig deeper. And we need to reflect Jesus in excellence in everything we do.
everything we do. When we reflect Him, you know, we extend grace in the midst of speaking an uncompromised truth. We're going to influence people. You won't influence them all, but you're going to influence a bunch. John said this of Jesus, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I'm closing with this tweet. It's a great one. Somebody needs to... St. Francis of Assisi said this. He said, preach the gospel. And if necessary, just use words. Let your life be seen. That's going to influence more than your words. Because people need to see we're different. And God's favor will be on you. There's some people in here this morning, you've got siblings that are lost. You have loved ones that don't know Jesus. And you've talked to them until you're blue in the face. They're not listening to words, they're watching lives. The greatest gospel is going to reach your family. The people closest to you is the life well lived. When they see that, you may think right now, well, you know, I'll live it before him, Pastor. It doesn't seem to be making a difference. Let me just tell you, it, yeah, it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, it, it's influencing them. Because there, there will be a day that, that, that God will allow something to occur in their life that they're going to crash. And that's grace. He's going to let them crash. He's going to let them hit their lowest. And you might think, well, you know, I have somebody. I don't see how they can go any lower. Let me tell you what. They, they can go lower. God will allow it to happen. So there will be a time they're going to look. They're going to look up and they're going to remember you and remember your life. And they're going to say, I hate being like this. I need change. And that's, that's going to be the hook. That's going to be the hook right there. That's for somebody out there today. Live the life. Live the life. And only use words if it's necessary. Just live it. If every head bowed, every eye closed, if you're out there this